Good evening. I'm Mike Perry, the Executive Director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. And tonight we have a, a talk not about a great American victory, but really about something that was tragic and held from the American people for a long time, the sinking of the HMT Rona. And our speakers tonight are Jason Markowitz and Michael Walsh, who are both affiliated with the organization who's trying to make sure this story gets, uh, gets heard. Uh, they're going to talk a little bit about their background and why they came to this project. So I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to them to begin the presentation. So enjoy, uh, enjoy their, their talk tonight. And I will take uh, questions if you use the question and uh, answer icon. I'll monitor those and pass those uh, at the end of their presentation. So welcome. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. And good evening. Uh, my name is Jason Markiewicz. I'm the current president of the Rona Survivors Memorial Association, and my grandfather was a survivor of the Rona sinking and a member of the 853rd Aviation Engineer Battalion. And my name's Michael Walsh. Uh, my stepfather, Don Dupre, was, uh, served in the Navy on the uh, minesweeper USS Pioneer, and he introduced me to the story. And I'm a past president of the Rona uh, <laughs> Rona Survivors Memorial Association. Doesn't roll off the tongue, folks. And uh, Jason and I will be your, or your presenters this afternoon. Hmm. Oh, thank you. We've had the pleasure of leading this organization collectively for the past 13 years and are honored to be with you here tonight. I'll discuss the events that led up to the attack, the engagement, the sinking, and a brief discussion of the aftermath. And I'll discuss why you never heard about it. Um, there's a lot of secrecy and uh, the effect it had on the men and their families. And then I'll give you a little bit about the organization and the memorial at uh, Fort Mitchell in Alabama. And I'll finish with a sort of bibliography, a list of books and websites that would be helpful if you want to pursue more of the story. All right, so we'll begin first with a baseline. Royal Navy historical statistics show that during the time of the KMF series convoys, over 2 million servicemen were transported on vessels through the Mediterranean to ports from Morocco to India and to many more places in between. Tonight, we will be discussing the HMT Rona and the ill-fated KMF 26, the convoy of troop ships and escort vessels attacked by the Luftwaffe off the coast of Algeria on the 26th of November, 1943. During that attack, the HMT Rona was struck by a radio-guided bomb and was ultimately lost. Along with nearly 1,150 souls, including 1,015 Americans. Aside from the name and the expansion of the KMF acronym, which means United Kingdom to Mediterranean Fast, very few know much of the history of the KMF convoys, including KMF 26. And it is an important primer to understanding why the Rona was there in the first place. The KMF series of convoys began in October of 1942 and continued through the end of the war with a new convoy departing Gorok on the Clyde in the UK about every 14 days. There were also KMS, or United Kingdom to Mediterranean Slow, convoys that usually took an extra 25% or about five days extra to get to their Mediterranean ports. KMS convoys typically carried resupply cargo and supporting equipment that were not needed in theater as quickly. Nevertheless, they were equally as important. In all, there were 55 KMF convoys comprising nearly 1,400 vessels for an average convoy size of approximately 25 vessels, including transports and escorts. In many cases, a ship was used in more than one convoy, so that number does not necessarily constitute individual ships, but rather a culmination of total vessels registered to give an approximation on complement. Beginning in World War I, the threat of German submarines or U-boats was so high and credible, coupled with the inability to escort every troop and or cargo ship individually, convoys were formed for their protection. In these convoys, large numbers of merchant ships carrying troops and supplies, equipment and more were grouped together and escorted by a smaller number of combat ships for that protection. However, these convoys had to stop for about six months as the Allies won the war in North Africa. The first KMF convoy, aptly named KMF-1, launched from Gurok on the Clyde in the UK on 26 October 1942, bound for Oran, Algeria. This was a new style of convoy, 
where troop ships and cargo vessels were loaded to capacity with personnel and equipment bound for North African ports in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, and the Allies prepared for Operation Torch. The convoys were very heavily escorted with between seven and 12 warships of various degrees to fend off enemy aircraft, surface vessels, and submarines. In fact, the troop ships themselves also carried an armament suite to aid in their own defense should they be required. KMF-1 was one of the largest convoys in the series, consisting of 76 total assigned vessels, including 13 troop ships carrying 30,900 personnel and 36 escorts on three 12-ship rotations. At any one time, the convoy still consisted of over 50 vessels. To make matters even more hectic, KMF-1 was destined for Algiers, the capital of French Axis occupation of North Africa and headquarters of General June. KMF-1 entered Port Algiers on 8 November 1942 and Operation Torch commenced. On that 8th of November, Operation Torch started with a three-stage attack. First, as depicted here on the slide, First, the establishment of firm and mutually supported lodgements in the area of Oran, Algiers, and Tunis on the north coast, and of Casablanca on the west coast. Second, the use of those lodgements as bases to acquire complete control over all of French North Africa, and if necessary, Spanish Morocco. Third, a thrust eastward through, eastward through the Libyan desert to take the Axis forces in the western desert in the rear and annihilate them. By 10 November, Allied forces controlled the landing areas, and by the morning of the next day, Vichy French forces in Algeria surrendered. The Vichy French spread from Casablanca through Tunis, and as part of that surrender agreement, provided aid to the Allied forces to stall the Axis powers, ultimately leading to their demise. By 13 May 1943, after six months of heavy fighting in, in the North African desert, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's forces were defeated. The Allies had not just defeated remnants of the Africa Corps, but a total Axis army of more than 320,000 men, dead, wounded, or more prisoners, and all of their equipment. After the successful conclusion of the Allied effort, the Mediterranean became open and accessible. KMF convoy destinations were extended to the cities of Alexandria, Egypt, and Port Said. With the arrival, success, and rapid deployment capability of the KMF convoys, it was the beginning, rather than the end, of the Navy's responsibility to support the other services and keep them supplied. A long series of follow-up convoys had to be designed in order to bring troops and equipment from Britain to Gibraltar and then onto the captured ports in North Africa. On 17 May 1943, only four days after the end of the North African campaign, the first KMF convoy passed through the Mediterranean en route to Alexandria. Routes continued into the Suez Canal and beyond a few months later. Not only did the relatively open sea lanes allow for the KMF convoys to absorb the lion's share of troop and equipment transport duties across the entire Mediterranean, it also prompted the British Admiralty to begin the drawdown of the Winston Special or WS series of convoys which had been used to bring troops and equipment to the eastern side of the Suez by sailing south around Cape Town, South Africa. This route was extremely long, and while not necessarily sailing in the possibility of Nazi-contested waters of the Mediterranean, they were still susceptible to attack from U-boats just the same. By November, the KMF convoys were moving along, and KMF-26 was about to begin its fateful journey. The weather on 8 November 1943 in Scotland was cold, wet, and inhospitable with temperatures barely over 40 degrees and a constant mist cycled with rain. In a week's time, the newly designated KMF-26 was set to shove off from Gourak on the Clyde and make way for Oran, Algeria. Commodore Hugh Davenport, or H.D. Wakeman Colville, a career Royal Navy officer, designated the HMS Birmingham as his flagship a town-class light cruiser with a storied and decorated service record in the Eastern Fleet, among others. By 12 November, Commodore Wakeman Colville had made his final preparations for KMF-26, decided upon a three-phased escort flotilla, and verified the route for the 11-day trip to Oran, Algeria, and the follow-on four-day voyage to Alexandria, Egypt. The large majority of these escorts were to be British Royal Navy vessels, and each of the original seven taking the convoy from Clyde to Gibraltar would be British. At Gibraltar, two destroyers, one cruiser, and one frigate 
would break away, while nine Royal Navy and four U.S. Navy vessels would join up for the next leg to Oran and Alexandria. Aside from the weather, the only threat they and all other convoys prepared for was the possible three-pronged attack from the enemy, including Luftwaffe aerial bombardment, surface ship engagement, and U-boats launching torpedoes from the deep. At 20.30 hours on 15 November 1943, Commodore Wakeman Colville took his place on the bridge of the HMS Birmingham alongside her commander, Captain H.W. Williams, and the convoy made way. In all, the convoy consisted of 20 merchant vessels carrying over 14,800 troops and was accompanied by one submarine, the HMS Stonehenge, and 10 escorts, including one destroyer, the Brilliant, one cruiser, the flagship Birmingham, four frigates, the Evenload, Jed, Rother, and Spey, and two Black Swan class swoops, the Woodpecker and the Pelican. It was a mighty picture, pitching and rolling over extremely choppy seas, for a week-long trip to Gibraltar. There were many additional hazards besides high sea states and cold weather. Numerous submarine scares plagued the convoy and at one time reportedly caused the entire convoy to turn 180 degrees to avoid the German threat. Regardless of this, the convoy continued to its destination and remained vigilant. As the convoy passed through the Strait of Gibraltar, radio operators reportedly began receiving troubling messages that Nazi air and naval forces had carried out numerous successful attacks on Allied shipping in the Mediterranean Sea. Despite the firepower of the escorts and the cannons on the troop ships, the enemy was capable and determined to disrupt Allied troop movement and cargo resupply. On 23 November, the convoy split as planned west of Gibraltar. KMF-26 dropped off four merchant vessels and was joined by nine Royal Navy vessels, U.S. destroyers Herbert C. Jones and Frederick C. Davis, and U.S. minesweepers, Portent, and Pioneer. As KMF-26 steamed toward the harbor at Oran, she included 16 merchant vessels and 18 escorts, some of which would be steaming ahead near Algiers and not remain with the greater convoy. In turn, some replacement escorts would be joining at Oran for the final leg to Alexandria. In the afternoon of 25 November, KMF-26 took on a whole new look. The large majority of the escorts that had traveled alongside from Gibraltar to Oran departed for Algiers, Tunis, Philipville, Alexandria, and Port Said. Joining the convoy was the Polish destroyer ORP Slezak, British destroyers HMS Atherston, HMS Catterick, and HMS Cleveland, British light cruiser HMS Colombo, and Greek destroyer HHMS Mia Olis. Remaining with the convoy were American destroyers Jones and Davis, as well as minesweepers Portent and Pioneer. Beginning in late October of 1943, numerous battalions of American servicemen landed in Oran, Algeria, awaiting transport to destinations in the Far East, including India and China. For over a month, the men trained, did odd jobs around the encampment, constructed buildings, exercised their minds and muscles, played softball, toward the nearby towns, and occasionally spent nights playing cards lit by some leftover cooking grease in a ration can, and trying not to take ill. The conditions in Algeria were awful. Their encampment was in a vacant field with no lights and freezing temperatures. It was 100 degrees during the day, but 30 degrees at night. Men lived in eight-man tents in an olive orchard. Fleas and ticks and lice, rampant. Many GIs came down with dysentery after only a couple nights. Then, to make matters worse, it rained. The ground soaked up the rain and caked mud to the GI's boots so thick they could hardly move. My grandfather remembered the mud was nearly impassable. The food was terrible, unless you consider onion sandwiches and dates to be fine cuisine. Other maladies like smallpox, malaria, and sandfly fever overtook the men, and even those who weren't ill, for the most part, were restricted to quarters by their commanding officers. Time passed slowly for the GIs in Algeria. Needless to say, when the orders came to board the troop ships, many of them were ready to go. That feeling didn't last too long. When orders came to pack up and move out, the men piled into trucks in the midst of a, of a beating rain to the outskirts of the town, then marched over two miles with full packs to Mers El Kabir, where they saw the troop ships tied to the docks. One member recalled seeing that the ships were British and believed they would be well taken care of. Men lugged full field packs, 
gas masks, rifles, bazookas, helmets, and life preservers. Three troop ships awaited their quarry in Mirz El Kabir, the HMT Rona, the HMT Rajula, her sister ship, and the HMT Egra. While trudging up the ramp onto the awaiting Rona, one member said, this has got to be the oldest ship in the world with riveted hull construction and teak wood decks. More than 2,000 American service members boarded the HMT Rona, including the entire complement of the 763 enlisted and 30 officers of the 853rd Aviation Engineer Battalion. Their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel A.J. Froelich, the senior ranking officer of the men berthed aboard Rona, was the troop commander. As one survivor mentioned to me in a conversation about Colonel Froelich, he was hard but fair. He expected a lot, but he was a good man. Froelich wrote of that day, the battalion boarded HMT Rona and were quartered on troop decks six, seven, and eight in the aft part of the ship. The entire day was spent loading troops and supplies. The troop decks were very crowded and the air was quite bad below decks. Commissioned in, in August of 1926, Rona spent 15 years as a luxury passenger liner for only a few hundred passages each trip before being requisitioned by the British Admiralty as a troop transport. During modifications at Hebron-upon-Tyne in England, armament was added including three 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, four half-inch twin barrel machine guns, and one 76 millimeter naval gun that fired 12 pound projectiles to a distance of 10,000 yards. Under the command of Australian Captain T.J. Murphy, with a British and Indian crew, and with over 2,000 passengers, the Rona was loaded to the gills. Six troop ships in all joined the convoy from Oran, carrying more than 11,000 soldiers. HMT's Rona, Agra, Rajula, and Koroa, HMS Ranchi, and the French-registered Benfora. This group of transports was known as the KMF-26 Annex. The annex left Oran on 25 November 1943, Thanksgiving Day, to join KMF-26 on the way to Port Said. The enlisted men aboard celebrated Thanksgiving with canned chicken as a substitution for the usual turkey dinner and bread rolls that many men described as filled with weevils. Many threw up their dinner over the side as the food mixed with the choppy waters of the Mediterranean Sea didn't blend well together. The following day saw more of the same in the Mediterranean, KMF-26 steamed toward Alexandria with six columns of four merchant vessels escorted by 10 heavily armed warships. The HMT Rona was positioned second from the rear in the port column, a place morbidly known as Coffin Corner. Colonel Froelich established a schedule of exercises to keep the men trained and ready for any emergency that may happen, including the possibility of abandoning ship. At 10.30 hours on the morning of the 26th, he called such a drill and practiced getting to the lifeboat station shortly thereafter. At 1600 hours, he did it again. While all of this was happening, what were the Nazis up to? Well, Major Hans Doctorman was a loyal Nazi pilot with aerial successes in France, England, and Russia. In early November 1943, Doctorman was assigned to Bomber Unit 40, stationed in various parts of occupied France where he joined the German attempt to use radio-guided bombs against an Allied convoy in the Atlantic, an effort that was ultimately unsuccessful. However, this did not stop the effort to improve targeting, radio sensitivity, and accuracy of the Henschel 293, a munition three years into development, already with hundreds of launches under its belt. The HS-293 radio-guided bomb, approximately 20 feet long and 15 feet wide, guided by radio signals to a receiver that controlled a gyroscopic autopilot, was powered by a Walter 109-507B liquid propellant rocket operating on hydrogen peroxide and sodium permanganate with air tanks. Produced 1,320 pounds of thrust and flew as fast as 560 miles per hour. It required two people to perform the task, a pilot and a bombardier. As one of only 36 pilots selected out of 4,000 applications, Doctorman was trained to fly the Henkel 177 bomber and would fly with two of the HS-293 under his wings. The bombardier in this case, Hans Zuther, was to use a joystick to guide the missile to the target. For context, the HE-177 had a crew of six with two gunners, a mechanic, and a wireless operator aboard as well. 
In the mid-afternoon of 26 November, some 35 planes, including HE-177s, HE-111s, Dorner 217s, Junkers 88s, and Focke-Wulf Couriers 90s, took off from the locations in southern France with 21 of the aircraft armed with two HS-293s each. At approximately 16.30 hours, KMF-26 was attacked by upwards of 30 Henkel HE-177 bombers, escorted by Junker 88 fighter bombers, and approximately nine torpedo-carrying aircraft. The weather was clear, but the heavy force winds created high sea states with 15 to 20 foot swells, complicating the gunner's accuracy as they shot at the attacking aircraft. Cruiser HMS Colombo reported that numbers one and three four-inch guns were washing down frequently. Destroyer HMS Atherston began firing its massive four-inch guns at the aircraft and engaging the glider bombs with her 20 millimeter Orlikon. Late into the attack, after numerous unsuccessful efforts by the Luftwaffe to strike the convoy, one lone aircraft came about and made one more attack run. The engagement had been going on for nearly an hour, and some reports say that upwards of 60 HS-293 glider bombs were launched, with the only impact being the one that hit the Rona. As the missile fired, survivor reports indicate it looked like a small jet coming from under the mothership. It flew with bang-bang guidance as radio relay delays complicated flight. It struck the Rona amidships, right in the engine room, blowing a hole in the hull that survivors recall was big enough to drive a truck through. When the engine room exploded, it set the Rona on a path to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Power was knocked out across the ship. Over 400 were estimated to have died in the initial blast and without power, some were unable to find stairways or passages to escape. Those who made it topside went from the proverbial frying pan into the fire. The ship was ablaze. Luftwaffe aircraft still patrolled the sky, and the concussion of anti-aircraft fire assaulted the ears. Some who survived the blast jumped from the burning ship and were immediately sucked under by the suction of the sinking. It was hard to stay calm, though some, uh, some survivors also mentioned, there was so much screaming it was hard to keep my head. My grandfather found a stairwell and having grown up in Hawaii was a good swimmer. He made his way away from the center line toward the high side of the ship where there was some open space in the water and jumped off. Panic had fully set in across the ship. Fights began on deck. As CO2 cartridges were being handed out for use in the life belts, more bloody fights sprung up. These were theoretic there were theoretically enough lifeboats to go around but thanks to some being destroyed in the attack, eight of them being stored inside the ship and not being able to be deployed, general disrepair, the salty sea air, the rust, and the inability of the Indian crew to tend to their duties, many of them were rusted in place or just incapable of launching. Men tried to break the latches, but most failed. The one who succeeded ended up only having one latch break, tipping the boat forward and dumping the occupants on top of one another in the water below. Captain Murphy sounded the abandoned ship call by word of mouth as the comm system was inoperable and anyone able tried to get into the water and away from certain doom. Within 15 minutes of the attack, the ship was literally slipping out from under the men's feet. Hundreds of soldiers in full uniform, boots, sometimes helmets, packs, and all were beaten mercilessly by the oil-soaked water. Some drowned. Some wore their life belts around their waist instead of under the armpits and tipped over and drowned. Some were pulled under by others struggling to stay afloat, and more were struck by debris in the water. Men who found ropes leading down to the water or any of the few lifeboats that made it were like ants climbing down. In some cases, the ropes gave way and dumped the soldiers unprepared for such a quick fall into the sea. Survivors recall seeing men hanging from the side of the ship as it went down, slumped over, heads submerged, tangled in ropes, lines, nets, and ladders. Captain Murphy could not identify how he managed to get off the ship, but recalled later that he was being showered with shell cases. Hundreds died, and hundreds more were in various states of panic, injury, and helplessness in the water, hoping to be rescued. But the Luftwaffe was still overhead. Cannon fire from escorts and a few vessels who stayed behind as rescue ships peppered the sky. KMF-26 continued to steam through the Mediterranean with only a few ships left behind to render protection and aid. Ships evaded steaming over the soldiers in the water. 
by 1830 hours, Rona had pitched up her bow and slipped into the depths of the water. Once she was out of sight, darkness fell. Survivors recounted how not even the moon or stars were visible. The only glimmer of hope was the searchlights that men could see flying across the water in the distance. For the better part of the next eight hours, rescue efforts were underway. Two United States minesweepers, the USS Pioneer and USS Portent, led the rescue effort alongside the British freighter Clan Campbell and the destroyer HMS Atherston, among others. Six rescue ships in all swept the water, picking up survivors and seeing to the wounded. The Pioneer carried the heaviest load, both literally and metaphorically. Many survivors remember the red-headed sailor, later known to be Harold Jones, who rescued any number of those in the water and helped them aboard the Pioneer. In all, 606 of the just over 900 survivors were rescued by the Pioneer and taken to Philipville to be treated for their injuries. Records show that some were rescued within 15 minutes, while the longest was in the water for just over 11 hours. My grandfather, rescued by the HMS Atherston, remembers being in the water for most of the night and estimates it was approximately eight hours until he was helped aboard. In fact, he told me that he swam, treaded water, held onto some driftwood, and did everything possible to keep warm and active. By the time he was rescued, he was so weak that when the British sailor tossed him a rope, he grabbed onto it and it slipped through his hands like a hot knife through butter. The sailor said, float, tie it around your waist, and I'll pull you up. The Pioneer, the Holcomb, the Atherston, the Mindful, the Hunt, and the Clan Campbell had brought more than 1,000 soldiers from the water, living, injured, and dead, that night and pulled into Philipville nearly 13 hours after the Rona had been hit. The dead and wounded were driven by ambulance to the British 67th and 100th field hospitals. There were no American quartermasters in Philipville, so survivors were given dry British uniforms to replace their wet ones while eating cookies and drinking tea. One survivor mentioned that, we assume the appearance of British soldiers with everything but the accent. For the 853rd Aviation Engineer Battalion, who had nearly 800 personnel on the Rona, they had lost 62% of their number, and only 129 answered roll call on the 27th of November. 10 officers were missing in action. 485 enlisted men were either dead or missing. And of the 278 survivors, 138 had been injured. In all, 1,015 American soldiers lost their lives that night, and 123 crew also perished. It was the largest loss of American life at sea in World War II. Two days later, on 28 November, the HMS Birmingham was reportedly engaged by a torpedo fired from German submarine U-407, nearly sinking her and resulting in 17 deaths. The next evening, on the 29th of November, KMF-26 was engaged again north of Benghazi, Libya, at approximately the same time of night. Fifteen Junker 88s dive-bombed the convoy in two waves. The escorts engaged the attacking aircraft with moderate success, only splashing one Junker and no ships were lost. The HMS Ranchi, Commodore H.D. Wakeman Colville's flagship, took a bomb through the forward part of the ship, destroying a wooden deckhouse and passing through the side of the vessel before detonating. One soldier was killed, three were wounded, and the Ranchi survived the attack. Another vessel in the convoy reported three near misses. On 30 November 1943, KMF-26 arrived at Port Alexandria, Egypt, and all parties breathed a sigh of relief. After a journey that began only 15 days prior from Clyde, Scotland, they had been engaged by the enemy four times, staved off over 60 guided bombs, splashed approximately 10 enemy aircraft, and two transports and one cruiser struck by enemy munitions and the HMT Rona was sunk. The larger statistic was in human lives lost, where nearly 1,200 had perished in the final four days of the journey. The convoy commander, Commodore Wakeman Colville, survived the transit and went on to lead additional convoys in the latter part of the war. HMT Rona Captain T.J. Murphy and Troop Commander, Lieutenant Colonel A.J. Froelich, survived the attack and continued to serve in other capacities. Many of the ships of KMF-26 had distinguished service in future engagements, including Anzio and Normandy, and at least two others were lost to the depths too soon. I hope you've enjoyed the historical perspective of the event, and now I will hand it over to Michael Walsh to take you on the rest of the journey tonight. We'll reserve time at the end for questions and are happy to answer them at that time. Michael, Thanks, the floor Jim. is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, go ahead and put it on, there you go. Um, 
a lot of people wonder why they've never heard of this incident if it was such a big deal, so many lost at, at sea. And a lot of it had to do with the classification of the incident. It was immediately declared secret. The men were told not to talk about it, not to write home about it, and basically just swallow it. <laughs> so give me the next slide, Jason. And um, even the uh, mail, this is a piece of mail that I've gotten, um, you can see down over in the lower left that it's been uh, censored. It, uh, all the outgoing mail of all the men, the officers and enlisted were all read and censored as needed. Of course, most men did what they were told and didn't write about it, but they did check. And next. So even this was February of 1944 in the New York Times. So it's two and a half months after the sinking. Finally, some news is hitting home. But if you look at it carefully, they, they have disinformation in it. So it's true, roughly 1,000 were saved out of 2,000. And it was the biggest transport loss. As a matter of fact, it was the biggest loss at sea in, in um, World War II. But it also says that it was in European waters. It doesn't mention the Mediterranean. And it also says that it was a submarine attack. That's one of the reasons of the secrecy was the weapon. Most people still today don't even know that the, uh, the Germans had guided missiles like, like the one you saw in the uh, animation, but they were there. So even two and a half months later, they, there's still disinformation out there. And it really left the families, they, they were pretty much all told that they're, they're um, their loved ones were missing in action. Very few were told that they were killed in action for some time. And uh, it had a big effect on people. And um, if you go ahead and click Jason and then click again, we'll watch uh, some of the testimonies about that. I talked to cousins and, and I'll, I'll tell them about the Rona. And they said, you know, I loved your father, but he was such a sad man. And he would try to, he would sit there and tell us war stories and like nobody believed him. And it, that breaks my heart because I know now what he was saying. He was just trying to find somebody. He was trying to be acknowledged, somebody to believe him. And then of course my mother, uh, she, he married my mother three months after he got home. And uh, I finally got it out of her that she never really knew what happened to him. She was very surprised. Um, and they had been married for a good 18 years. And I, and I th find it very, very sad that he could not um, get on with his life. And I've talked to other survivors and they really did get on with their lives. They made something of themselves, but my dad was not able to do that. Well, while I was in the service, I talked to other people that were on the ship, but after, I, after the war was over and I got out of the service, I didn't talk to, uh, I didn't even, tell my parents about it. And you know, I've read stories, the others were the same way. You wanted to get on with your new life and not repeat <laughs> all that happened over the past several years. They didn't have any children. So that none of his, he didn't have any heirs to see what happened to daddy. So, and both his mom and my father died not knowing what happened to him. And to find out that it was something that 
was kept a secret, I think, makes it even worse. Because there are so many family members that are gone that that I'm sure through the years anguished over what had happened to him. But, uh, you know, we never heard too much of anything. And, and even after the ship got sunk, it was quite a while before we ever found out anything from Washington. They, they just counted him missing, and then they said uh, something about he was lost at sea in the heavy waters, and uh, the ship went down fast, and they never got over that. Never. Never, never. I mean, as far as they, they went on living, but there was an empty spot. Yeah, we all missed him very much. He was only 21 years old. They were not treated the way they should. There were all these families that were never told what happened to their boys. They just got this telegram that they were lost at sea and didn't even give the name of the ship. You can't ever make up for all of these years that the parents grieved and wondered and went to fortune tellers, uh, just had no idea what became of their boys. His mother had already died. He, she died uh, three or four years earlier. He had a father, two bro three brothers and two sisters, and a wife that he left behind. He had just married. Uh, he was, uh, he just turned 22 when he died. My mother's dad got a telegram saying that he had died. <clears throat> and that they, all they told us was that he died in the Mediterranean near North Africa. And that's all we knew. My son plans on being a history major, and he, did, he didn't know anything about it, and none of the professors do, and everyone you talk to, none of them know anything about the Rona in World War II and all the loss of life. So I think it's important that we get it in the history books. Yeah, so these videos um, I shot over the years, I, um, by profession, am a video producer, corporate video producer, and uh, I after going to the reunions a couple of years with my stepfather, I just realized that somebody had to record these stories or they'd be lost. And I, I collected quite a, a, a library, I'll call it, of these interviews that have saved these stories. And after a few years, about um, three or four years, I realized that if I did do a documentary at that time, that um, only small quotes from each man would be saved and it wouldn't tell each man's story. So I realized that if I had transcripts made of those interviews, I could create a book and, and I did that. And um, each chapter is a man's story told in full by whatever his story was, I didn't edit it. Each, and some, you know, some, um, conflict with each other, but it's okay. It's their memory. What can you say? So I never intended to do a book. I never intended to do a lot of things, but it was just um, realizing the importance of this incident and these people's stories. I mean, um, in 2018 was the last time we had a survivor at our reunions. Um, and he has since passed away. It's not that there's no survivors left, it's just the ones that can travel and have gone to the reunions. So I'll talk a little bit about the organization. Go ahead and click, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> um, in the early 90s, uh, John Fevet, uh, who's center front in the brown suit, um, he, he wrote a story his wife asked him to write a story for his children to have this, this story written down. But then he, she, he wrote a modified version for a local newspaper and they ran a story and um, it got picked up and that's 
that's kind of when the story started to come out, early 90s. Um, and at the same time, a few of the survivors and their wives started to put together the idea of having a reunion. And they did. This is not a picture of the first reunion. But uh, I think the first reunion, let's see, I got a little cheat note over here, 1993 in uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, um, was the first time they all met. It was 50 years since the incident. And um, I started going in 2001 in, in Tucson and, and started to document their stories and their reunions. And this was, for me, this would be uh, some of the earlier reunions that I went to would be about this size um, of survivors. And um, if you click for me, please, Jason. Um, then they started to you know, pass away or um, they would get ill and couldn't travel and we had fewer and fewer. And um, I hope I don't get emotional, but this picture makes me emotional. Um, this was uh, a reunion where normally the picture, like you just saw a minute ago, they're all dressed up. And uh, this one, they're not so dressed up. Well, the reason is, is normally I would take the formal picture the last night when we would have a big formal dinner and everybody would come and uh, dress up. This was shot the first night. Um, Ruth Canny, who was the wife of a survivor, um, just looked at me that night and said, you know, you should take a group shot. And I did. I took, you know, against tradition, I took a group shot. Well, the gentleman in the front row on the far left in the bright blue passed away that night. It's his last photo. <clears throat> and the gentleman on the far right in the front with the eye patch, that was the first time he ever came and um, he left that, he only came that first day. So this picture um, means a lot to me. But it's also significant to see that the numbers of the men were decreasing. And um, part of the reason for the, uh, the organization was to create a memorial. And um, John Fevet was the spearhead on that. And he uh, found a place, it was difficult for him to find a place that would receive the memorial. Um, Arlington didn't offer him anything except he could have a small plaque on a tree at Arlington. He was, he was pretty insulted by that with that huge loss of men that they, they would only offer that. So he looked around and he found at Fort Mitchell in Alabama, they had a national cemetery there that welcomed him. So if you click, um, this is the plaque that is there now. It was dedicated in 1996, and it's, it's still there in a wonderful little spot. And uh, let me double check. If you click in 2008, we, we had a rededication. And that's John Fevet on the right and my stepfather on the left, representing the Pioneer and the Rona. Pioneer was always a, a little bit of a favorite of the men because the ship had saved over 600 men. That was really amazing. And a lot of people don't know this. The, um, the men on the Rona were all green. They'd never seen combat. Well, the men on the Pioneer hadn't either. So it made it even more amazing. So if you click, um, this is what the memorial looks like. That was the year, um, fair number of the men were there. Um, they were really, really happy to be there and we were happy to have them. One of the interesting things about the organization is obviously it was started by survivors and the first um, presidents of the organization were all survivors. And then in 2003, I think, yeah, 2003, um, the first son, a son became president. 
So it passed a generation. It went from the fathers to the son. I was the next president, so I'm on that level of generations, the son. And now it's passed to Jason, who is a grandson. So the organization itself is still thriving and doing well. And we, we had a, a reunion organized for um, Salt Lake City, Utah this year, which had to be um, postponed to next year for obvious reasons. But in that time period, unfortunately, we lost um, Gus Geekus, who was a gentleman on the far right with the red tie. Uh, he was the last survivor that had been coming on a regular basis. And um, it, again, there's still a survivor or two. I know of one in my area, um, but again, most can't travel. So the other thing I wanted to share with you is information. I mean, even in this amount of time, we haven't been able to, we were only able to scratch the surface, honestly. So if you click to the next slide, I'll show you a few books and, and tell you about them um, that, are, that are out there. This one I consider, I call it the gold standard. It's by Carlton Jackson. He uh, used to come to our reunions. He has passed away since. He wrote, uh, it went by another title. If you remember it, I'd never remember the name of the title, Jason. Yeah, it's called Forgotten Tragedy. All right, it originally came out as Forgotten Tragedy under a different publisher. And when yeah, the Naval Institute Press published it under Forgotten Tragedy. That's it. Yeah. And then when it was uh, republished in a different um, publisher, they, they wanted a different name. So this is the most current book. Unfortunately, it's out of print. And it's, you can find them, but um, people seem to want a lot of money for these. And I don't understand that. Uh, but he, and Carlton Jackson, was a history professor. And he did research in the National Archive. He went to Germany and he interviewed Hans Doctorman. Um, he, he just did everything right. I mean, all the, all the resources and footnotes. And um, if you get one book, this is the book to get. And um, so keep that in mind and go ahead and click to the next one. These are my books, the ones I was talking about. These are different than his. These are memoirs, if you want to say it. These, each man has a chapter in each of these. It ended up being two books because there was so much material. But um, they're just the men's stories as told by them. These, it's not a historical piece. It does have uh, some in the front that gives you the incident and talks about it. and things like that, but um, these books are, are really, they're interesting to read, but they're, they're really meant to just capture these men's stories somewhere that it can be accessed. And so um, these are still in print and you can even get them in Kindle. And uh, if you like Kindle, they're really cheap. <laughs> you can save a lot of money, but um, again, they're, they're in print so that they're not hard to find. And then go ahead and click. Now, uh, Jim Bennett, uh, this was kind of a tribute to his brother. His brother was um, a casualty on the Rona. And he wrote this book. And it's a good book. Uh, it's a little harder to find. It is still in print. Um, and, and I don't mean to dissuade anybody, but Carlton Jackson's is, again, the gold standard. Uh, because that was his profession. He'd written a number of books and done, you know, history and so forth. So uh, one more click. This is, this book is not about the Rona, but if you like World War II and you want to know more about these radio guided bombs, uh, Marty Bollinger did a heck of a job. He's um, an amazing person. He's come to our reunions. He's spoken to the group. Um, he did so much research on, on his, his book. But again, it's not about the Rona, even though the Rona shows up in there. It's about the, um, the guided bombs. And uh, it's well worth reading if you want to follow your interests in that direction. And then another click. 
So now we're into websites. And um, like I said earlier, I, I'm a video producer by trade. I'm retired now, but I've been working with um, Jack Vallow of Ultra Vision Films, and we're working on a documentary. And this is our website, Rona Classified. And Rona Classified is, is a very good um, resource if you want to go there. Um, it has a sample of the, the, the video. Uh, um, there's so much. I mean, you can uh, search by state for uh, casualties by state, which is unusual. There, there's, it's well worth just checking it out. And we're, we're on our way there. If you really, if you want to donate, there's a button to donate. It's, it is um, uh, 501c3. So if you're into taxes and stuff, that's a good thing. And then uh, finally, uh, go ahead and click. Similar to Carlton Jackson's gold standard, I would say if you're going to go to one website, this is the website of the Rona Survivors Memorial Association uh, that both Jason and I are president over the, well, I'm past president. Um, this has a lot and it's, it's a very active site now. This is where you go. If you wanna find out about the next reunion, you can get, there's a, an entire list of all the survivors an entire list of all the casualties. Um, and uh, the news, there's a newsletter now that's, that shows up in there. A um, lot, a lot of really good information. So again, if you only remember one thing, or one resource, because um, the bibliography that I gave, I believe is on that site also. So um, you can get that information there also. So ronasurvivors.org, uh, just remember the org and, and that Rona is R-O-H-N-A. And that's my little bit there. And then the last thing is, uh, this is in the background, this is, where most of the Rona men went. And I don't mean those graves because most of the men's bodies were never recovered. They have a wall of remembrance there. It's in Tunisia. And um, some of the men have gotten there in the past and they've been very moved. But Charles Osgood picked up the, uh, the story from, after seeing um, what John Fever had been up to. He, he found out about the story and he did a, a radio piece about it and he ended it with, with that quote. And it's really says, exactly, I'm not gonna read it. Uh, it really says exactly what I think happened. It's just, we never knew. Most people just never knew. So with that, um, if you want to go to uh, this, our contact information, um, either Jason or I, you can email us. There's, uh, again, there's the um, Rona Survivors website, which, again, is a, a great resource. And I think that concludes our presentation. So if Mike wants to come and we'll come and give questions. Uh, and, uh, First question, uh, are the photos of the men going overboard real Rona photos or examples that were pulled from other sources? So the, uh, the photo of the ropes was actually a photo to demonstrate. That was not from the Rona. There were no photos being taken during that time. So it was a demonstration to kind of elude what getting down those ropes was like. Uh, next question, uh, was there any accountability from the countries involved, US, UK, or India for the deaths uh, ever processed or was it just sort of completely washed under the table? Yeah, no, there was no accountability at all. Uh, nothing on the ship's uh, condition that it went to sea in? You know, there's things that we didn't say that um, really could get some people in trouble, I think, is um, the, the conduct of the Indian crew, uh, the condition of the ship. There were a few things in there. And uh, one of the things that struck me over the years, I've been to the National Archives, I've seen the orig original documents. And one of the things I remember seeing was um, a report that we had kept 
trying to get the British to, because it was a British convoy, they owned it. And so they also owned whether you could send out news releases. And the U.S. was wanted to send out more information and uh, whoever it was on the British side, I never got that end of the, the communication, but they wouldn't allow it. They wouldn't allow it. That's why you got stuff like you saw in the um, uh, New York Times where there's disinformation in there and it's even two and a half months later, there's still, it wasn't until roughly, what is it, maybe six months later that um, more information came out. Is any, uh, is any of this information on your website? That's a good question. Um, well, I know that there's, there's a, a pretty healthy group of links on the website that take you to various web resources. Uh, National Archives has a, a database search. World War II uh, uh, websites have research. There's USAAF data uh, has research capabilities that will show you casualties from from the Rona, you just type in 27 November 1943, which is the date they use for the death dates, and you can pull up the list. So there's a lot of web opportunities out there without having to go to the library and go through Microfish and that kind of stuff. But Jason, a lot of it is coming web-based. Jason has a pretty good website about the 853rd also. There's a lot of good information there. Okay. I think that that's uh, posted on, our, on the uh, Rona website. Yeah. Um, I wasn't going to be self-serving, but thank you, Michael. <laughs> no, that's a, you know, <laughs> the information. You've done the research, it could be self-serving. Uh, did, did the British put the same classification on the sinking of the Rona as the U.S. did? Mm -hmm. that, there, yeah, they have uh, documents from the British Ministry of Defense I'm, I'm looking at here on, on my wall right now. And they have it classified with their labeling as well. They, they were not as restrictive. Uh, ours was for 50 years. And so it really wasn't supposed to be talked about until 1993. And that, that, uh, that shows you the level of secrecy they were putting on it. Uh, for the, the British, they were marking it classified. So at, at that point, it was basically just a way to keep the story a little bit removed from the top of the, of the stack. Uh, and then really to go hunt it down, they weren't publicizing a lot of information. And for a long period of time, because the U.S. kept it so secretive, uh, there wasn't really a lot of research being asked about it. And so slowly but surely, you can get that shuffled away. Um, someone asked about the notation on several of the old documents. It's at first IND period. What is that? Yeah, that's a military terminology for an endorsement. So as you're doing an, an intern memorandum and you have multiple levels of chain of command that need to approve the document, you're going to get an endorsement letter. So it'll be written by someone down the chain that sends it up to an executive officer, that sends it to a commander, that sends it to the next level. Each of those require an endorsement to say, I've seen it, and then it moves on to the next step. Um, Catherine, that we all know, uh, joined us tonight. And uh, she wants to know about Hans document in the aftermath of the war. Well, uh, I know that the book that Michael put up there with the Allied Secret, uh, same as Forgotten Tragedy, which I'll just kind of show you right here, this, this book here. This is the Forgotten Tragedy uh, covering of the same thing. But uh, they actually go through, and, and as Michael was saying, with the research that was done in Germany and the interviews to, to Hans Dockermann and, every, and people that were involved on the German side as well, uh, they do carry on uh, in the book about what happened afterward. In fact, they mentioned that uh, upon landing, uh, the adrenaline of the Nazi crews uh, from all the aircraft that came back was so high that they, they didn't sleep that night. Uh, they, they weren't sure whether it was successful or what was it going to be seen like. They knew that they made it back, you know, for the most part, but that he didn't sleep well that night. And then there was a lot of things afterward that, that uh, he looked back on to, to say, you know, I, I, you know, you try to figure out, did you do the right thing or not? And he never quite came to grips with that. And I know as you take a look at, the we at our website, you know, Michael, I know you want to kind of talk about uh, his, his uh, son coming over and talking to us, right? Yeah. Go for now, it. The, the interesting part is that uh, although Hans Dockerman never came to the United States, his son Ludger uh, became, you know, um, the Bering Sea crab fisherman type. That, that's what he did. He lived, I think it was in Kodiak. And uh, he became a U.S. citizen. He died last year. 
and he had two sons, uh, Sean and KC. Uh, at least one of them's a fisherman. I'm not sure. They live up in the Seattle area, or generally, that, that part of the country. And um, one, one of the reunions, we had a reunion in Seattle. It was interesting that uh, Ludger came with one of his sons and uh, they brought, brought fish and all kinds of stuff. And uh, we had a big cookout uh, with all the survivors and families. And um, they, they, particularly Ludger was afraid that um, they wouldn't be well received by the, the men who had been bombed by his, his father. But you know, to a man, nobody held it against him. It was a wonderful experience. Um, they just said it was war. You did what, you, you know, it's, your father did what he had to do. We did what we had to do and, and there was no grudge. It was really interesting to see. Okay. A question, how far off do you think is the movie? It's a while because uh, COVID has knocked us back quite a bit. There were a lot of interviews that were supposed to be done. There was a lot of uh, research and the um, National Archives is closed right now. Uh, we raised a fair amount of money and it's been keeping us going. Um, and uh, we've been making headway uh, with what we have, but there's things we need to do. And um, it, it, it's at least a year away, I'm pretty sure. Because uh, we lost a year. <laughs> We've all lost more than a year sometimes. So. Yeah, it's true. Uh, any closing comments, either of you? Well, um, I'll go first. I'll just say, um, you know, I understand there were approximately 50 people uh, registered for this program, and that's 50 more people uh, that have just heard the information. And, and as we put at the end of it, uh, the historical piece of it was to give you some context of convoys and some context about why the Rona was there in the first place, to give a little bit of, of a primer before going into the attack itself. Um, the historical context is, is there, but it's not well known. And it's, it's important to transmit the data of, of this entire event and, and what all happened around it. Uh, and so you guys have a, a little peek into this and knowing that Rona Classified is on the way and you've got the website uh, ability to go research you know, from home right now, which we're doing a lot of things from home right now. You have the ability to kind of uh, learn a little bit more about it with the resources we've got here um, and just be able to carry that message forward. That quote from Charles Osgood, Osgood we put at the end on purpose uh, you know, to try to capitalize on the fact that um, people just didn't know. And so we're trying little by little to make sure that gets remedied. You know, I had a, a real life experience with that, that quote. Um, if you remember way back in the old days when we used to actually be able to go to a live presentation, uh, there was one here where I live and um, the uh, Naval War College is nearby and, and a professor was in an author uh, of note was giving a presentation about um, convoys in the Mediterranean in World War II. And I listened to his whole presentation. And afterwards, um, you know, you could go up and talk to him. And, and I asked him if he knew about the Rona and he had never heard of it. And that's amazing to me, a, a man of that level, uh, not having heard of it. So our job is not done. We're going to keep going and try to get the story out and um, get these men the um, recognition that they deserve. Well, I want to thank you for, for coming online tonight and doing this presentation, uh, uh, Jason and Michael. And as, as Jason said, uh, uh, the 50 people who signed up for this lecture, uh, you'll be receiving that sort of the last question that was asked, but I'll, I'll say that we'll be uh, uh, posting this to our YouTube site in two to three days. Uh, we'll send out a notification to everyone who signed up for the, uh, the lecture tonight so they know. And then I would just ask that when we post, uh, send that notification out to you, you send it to your friends so that they are able to come and uh, watch this, uh, this lecture. Because we would really like to have this presentation because it is uh, an unknown event of the war. Uh, get out to a much broader audience uh, uh, so that they understand uh, some of the sacrifices uh, that our soldiers, their families uh, have suffered uh, in support of our nation's objectives. So. Thank you for coming tonight. Thanks again, Michael and Jason, and uh, look forward to talking to you in the future.
Thank you for the opportunity. Right, thanks, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night.